Okay. Well, I'm so happy to see all of your beautiful faces on my computer screen today. Um, Alicia and I are going to go ahead and introduce ourselves and just kind of throw out some topics, I think, for consideration. And we just really wanted to give all of you an opportunity to ask any questions that you could think of now that you can bend the ear of a professional organizer and a dietitian and nutritionist. So Alicia, I'll ask you if you want to introduce yourself first. Sure, sure, sure. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, uh, my first career was as a chef and I went back to school later on to become a dietitian. So I worked in food service for 16 years and then transitioned to become a dietitian. And then um, I've done this nutrition work for over 10 years now. And I consider myself a food database, a database of foods. So I know what's in the grocery stores. And so um, I'm also one of my skill sets or one of the many are um, creating simple recipes. Uh, one of my recipes is um, chicken salsa verde. It's like a pound of chicken, two cans of black beans, a jar of salsa verde, Herdez brand, and a bell pepper add like a salad or you know Mexican slaw or whatever so I'm all about like making it super easy um, to make the whole meal planning situation happen because once we have the meal planning in a sustainable way that's not too much uh, we can do all the rest of the other things that we want to do in life um, so I work with clients one-on-one -on -one to meet their needs and I literally like work with people where they are to support them to where they want to be and it's a journey um, and then I have a group meal planning program. It's, it's more of a life program. It's called quick and delish life and meal planning as an aspect of it earlier today. And I have a, a meal plan, a session tomorrow, quick and delish life, um, uh, tomorrow at 12 PM Pacific time. The topic is the Mediterranean diet and lifestyle and how to implement it. Uh, the ben health benefits. Um, so if anybody here wants to join tomorrow or get the recording, I'm happy to add that. Um, to your um, your homework um, for you. <laughs> and we're, uh, you know, open to hearing any questions you have about nutrition and organization, certainly. Um, and, um, you know, we want this to be like, you can ask anything, literally, that's what this um, session is called. And we don't want you to feel, um, we want you to feel like you can ask anything. Um, and there is only unasked questions um, no stupid questions. <laughs> That's correct. Um, so I think everybody on this call knows me except for Hana. So I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm Stacy Tuntry and I am a professional organizer. I have done about two years of residential in-home organizing and I'm kind of switching gears right now to digital organizing and productivity. So there's a lot of, um, overlap, it turns out, between organizing and success in the kitchen, you know, maintaining good, optimal health and nutrition. And I, it's kind of funny, Alicia and I, like we initially, that connection didn't really hit me that hard. But when we started talking, I was like, oh my gosh, if I didn't have a really well-organized kitchen and all kinds of productivity tools, we would spend more money, spend way more money than we need to on food. We would waste more food. Um, but we've got a pretty like running a pretty tight ship in our household because of a lot of the productivity tools that that I've implemented in our household. So that's just something that um, I don't want to keep all to myself. <laughs> I would love to share that with you guys. Um, so, yeah, I, please, if anybody has any questions, let us know. I can also tee up some um, some topics. Any questions or comments come to mind? I have a question. I want to know how to best use or utilize corners, whether it's a closet or whether it's the pantry. It seems like it's an awkward space. Corners are definitely an awkward space. I like Lazy Susans for those, like the little, the, the ones that you can just set inside. You can buy them on Amazon. They're anywhere from like seven to $15, depending on how fancy you want to get. You can get um, the ones that are just like a, like a, turnstile like a, just a shallow tray or ones that have a little bit of a lip on it you can get them with dividers you can get them two or three tiers high um, there's all kinds of different versions of that product but I like putting those in corners because then you can just turn the thing around if you're trying to grab something at the back of that corner 
Um, lazy little- Susan is working hard. She is not lazy. That's right. It's a complete misnomer. She's a very hardworking Susan. They're, they're also really good. Like a lot of times you have shelving, uh, sort of, I have some alpha shelving. Let's see on this side, they're little baskets, but sometimes people have shelves, um, that are that same open basket. And those lazy Susans are good there too, because it actually gives you a solid surface so that if you put something in it, it doesn't fall through the slats. Stacy, you yes. said something about your, your productivity tips really help. Um, you're much more efficient. You're not wasting food. Uh, and I, I love those. What would be your top three productivity tips? Oh, good question. First of all, never, never go to the grocery store without an actual grocery list. (laughs) I think most people go to the grocery store when they have time and that doesn't necessarily overlap with any strategic planning about what they're there to buy. So if you just go to the grocery store with no list and you're kind of trying to think on your feet about what sounds good for the week, you're probably going to be missing ingredients. You might throw some impulse purchases into the cart. uh, And then inevitably by the end of the week, you're going to have ingredients you didn't use and stuff that you're missing. So I would say definitely have a list. It's Doug. Thanks for joining us, Doug. Um, Doug, I'm giving my top three tips for productivity in the kitchen. So number one, never go to the grocery store without a list. Um, And kind of feeding into that, I guess number two would be Menu planning is a really critical thing to do for in pursuit of saving money and reducing food waste and just making your life less crazy. So I like to do menu planning. And as a part of that, if I'm making two or three recipes, I go through that list and I look to see what ingredients I already have at home, anything we're missing. Um, we actually use, we're on a, a Mac, both Jesse, my husband and I are on a Mac. So we have, it's the notes app that is it's a native app that's built into the Mac environment, but I'm sure there's something very similar for PC. In fact, I think it's called notes and you can share, you can share lists with that app, which is wonderful because if we run out of something, we add it to the list. So now when I go to the store, in addition to the ingredients that I know we need for these specific recipes, if we're out of staples like milk or eggs or bread, whichever one of us use the last of it puts it on the list. In theory, it's not 100% of the time, but <laughs> it, but it usually works out. So if, if whoever has time to go to the store, we have the same list and, and we're prepared. So we're not doing a lot of impulse buys. And then the third tip I think would be get rid of any utensils or cookware that you never use because that stuff is clutter and it's taking your attention off of it. It's, it's in your way and it's hard for you to focus and find the things that you're actually trying to use if you have a lot lot of extraneous stuff in the way. So give yourself an opportunity to go through your kitchen and purge a few items. You can keep them, but maybe just move them to another part of the house, a closet or something for less used utensils and cookware. Thank you. Go ahead and replace the the equipment or utensils or whatever. Uh, Utensils usually don't have to be replaced that often, but there might be something that's like kind of have, has a little melty corner or something, go ahead and replace like the, the scratched up, you know, pans or whatever, go ahead and replace items that you use often that you're in love with. That's your favorite thing, because there's usually, um, it's, there's usually some sort of chemical contamination when we're using suboptimal equipment and we just need to get rid of it and recycle it or throw it away, whatever the best option is and move on with your life and start fresh. Thank you. Yeah, we we use um, Amazon Alexa as a way to keep a grocery list together. Yeah, that's perfect. To it. Yeah, it's so easy. We keep that uh, Alexa in the kitchen. So whenever we're out of something, one of us will just say, Alexa, add whatever to the shopping list. And then we both have it on our phones. Yeah. So shared list is really easy. Good job. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> It's so awesome when I hear people actually collaborate together to make things happen in in the home. It just makes things easier. Another 
another thing that we like to do in this, um, Jesse and I have a chest freezer. So this is a problem that maybe some of you do not have, but we, it's pretty capacious and we have a lot of stuff in there down towards the bottom. And for years, we probably go through it once a year and do like a, you know, defrost and get everything out of there and see what's, what's still lingering at the bottom. And there would just be freezer burned yuck at the bottom, like every single time. And we ended up throwing away so much food. I think a lot of folks shop for frozen food with really good intentions thinking I'm going to, um, if you're buying bulk at Costco, maybe I'm going to get 10 chicken breasts for the price of three. This is awesome. And you put it in the fridge or the freezer and it goes so far towards the back. If you don't know it's there, you're not going to get to it. And not that it's, it won't be food safe a year later, but it's not going to be the quality definitely depreciates over time. So one of the productivity hacks that we use in our house is we have a shared freezer list as well. So when I shop and I'm putting things into the freezer, I actually add that to the, the freezer manifest. And then when I take things out, I cross it off that list. And that's another fun thing. Like if we're, if we happen to be at the store, and we don't have a list. I can pull up the freezer list and be like, we don't need to buy chicken. I've already got three frozen breasts at home. So <laughs> it's kind of like you're taking your kitchen with you into the rest of your life. So if you need to plan things on the fly, it's a little bit easier because you have that information at your fingertips. Thanks to technology. And it's not another app. There's going to be apps in the future that are going to be maybe fancy that are built into your future refrigerator that you haven't yet purchased or maybe not yet designed or built yet. And so, but we have like the notes in our phone or we have a simple tool to make it happen now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's just like sometimes um, using what we have and then we might need a break from that tool and try something different because we need to do things in a different way to actually keep it going. Um, and it might not be, you know, creating a, um, a food list um, with Alexa instead of the notes in your phone or whatever. Um, but it, we need to make sure to prioritize variety in general um, because marketing is telling us to try variety in different ways that may or may not be helpful for health. Like vegetables are a great thing to try new vegetables. Alicia, talk <laughs> about, um, you just reminded me, talk about the importance of different textures when you're assembling a dish and how that can actually trick your brain into feeling full and satisfied. Oh, absolutely. So we need to eat the different colors um, to enjoy our meals. And we also need different flavors um, like including sweet, even if, you know, some people say they don't like sweet foods, but they like bell peppers, they like carrots, they like sweet potatoes. So those are like sweet foods um, and they're caramelized onions. And so we need different colors for the food to be attractive. We need different textures um, so we could chew through things. And then that means we're probably going to get enough fiber to help us feel full. Um, and there's such thing as like, say if you have, I don't know, say like, um, hmm, let's say a meal, like, uh, let's say fish. It doesn't really matter. If you don't like fish, you can just replace it with chicken. So like a protein, and then let's go with fish or chicken, and then say mashed potatoes. So the texture of fish and, and mashed potatoes are similar. They're soft. And then you, say you have some like overcooked vegetable that you're not really into. And so maybe that's kind of not exciting to eat. And then there could be an increased risk of wanting dessert afterwards or something else because there was less satisfaction in that meal because of the texture um, and the colors and the variety of flavors. Um, and so if you had a meal like um, salmon with, um, just roasted salmon, simple, plain roasted salmon, and then, or replace that with another protein that you like. See I, how I'm willing to modify anything, um, because I know not everybody likes any one thing. And so, um, okay, roasted salmon or chicken, and then you have a cabbage slaw with some shredded carrot, and then some black beans, and then some cilantro, lime juice. Um, you can add anything else you want to it. 
and then um, maybe some roasted sweet potatoes on the side, like wedges with like roasted with paprika or something like that. So then you have different textures and chewing through the cabbage slaw is like enough for the body to get this satisfaction. I think we need to chew th through things to like release stress. So if you had like a delicate butter lettuce salad with some cherry tomatoes and then maybe some cucumber and then you had zucchini noodles for the carb because you're like, oh, I'm going to go low carb. I'm not going to I'm not gonna have the pasta. And then you had like um, a little bit of chicken or maybe there's some beef and like the some ground meat or whatever with the zucchini noodles with the red sauce. Then the zucchini noodles and the butter lettuce tomato salad, that's a low fiber. Those are low fiber vegetables. They're not bad, they're just lower in fiber. Um, and then you got some protein from whatever the chicken or the ground meat in the sauce but there's not enough fiber, there's not enough texture to chew through, and um, uh, it's low in carbohydrate as well. So after having that, you may feel satisfied. It's a healthy meal. I'm not saying it's not healthy, but there's a risk um, that it's low fiber, low in carbohydrates, and then um, increased risk of needing something later on. I'm not saying you don't need anything later on. It's just that particular meal. I could pretty much talk forever. <laughs> You're reminding me though, another one of the little hacks that we use at our kitchen to, to just, the fact that you eat with your eyes first, you mentioned having foods that are different colors. It's just, it makes you so happy when you see a beautifully assembled meal. And we have Fiesta plates, Fiesta wear um, plates in our kitchen. So we've got four different colors of plates. And <clears throat> I love that because whatever we're having for dinner, I will choose the plate that is the, that gives the most contrast to the food because it sets off the food in a really beautiful way and makes it that much more pleasant of an experience to eat it. That's awesome. And I did want to ask a pop quiz question from everyone here. So that example of the zucchini noodle, butter lettuce salad with the cherry tomatoes and a little bit of protein, like the ground meat or the chicken, what could you add to that meal to make it more satisfying? Roasted potatoes. Garbanzo sure. beans. Yes, beans, potatoes. Anything else? So we're adding a starch or a carbohydrate with fiber. Right, but to get that texture, the crunch or something, I would do like string beans, but like hardly, my husband doesn't really cook them. They go in the pan, they get flipped and, and they're done. So <laughs> when people are over, I tell them if they need me to microwave their green beans, I can do it. But you have teeth for a reason is what he says. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some vegetables with some more texture to chew through. We have, uh, we have this whole um, nut and seed station in our kitchen, which is Jesse always, he pauses every time I'm, a, I've plated something. He's like, are we done judging? Can I take it now? Because every single time he's like about to take a plate, I'm like, uh-uh, there's more. And I'm always putting nuts and seeds and sprinkly things on top of everything we eat to give it that just a little bit of extra texture. Sometimes it adds salt too. Like if you haven't, if you have a dish that doesn't have a lot of salt, maybe you've got like salted sunflower seeds is a good way to add a little extra flavor and seasoning and also some healthy fats. Totally. Another way to add um, fiber and crunch is, has anybody had these dry roasted edamame, also known as soybean nuts or soy nuts? Um, I, I like not. this particular brand um, because it doesn't have a lot of sodium, so that it's multi-purpose. And um, I got them on our, um, on Amazon. So 100 calories and, you know, like whatever about calories, but like the more important information is in the hundred calories, it's 10 grams of protein and four grams of fiber. And there you get like 30 beans in a bag. I don't have a bag here, but anyway, it's a small bag, 30 beans. It's a, a decent amount. Um, and so it's a perfect snack because it's a protein with carbohydrate with fiber. You could add that to a salad. If you ordered a salad at a restaurant and you were like, oh, I don't want the bread because I'm not having the bread for whatever reason. And Alicia, what's you, the brand name on that? Yeah, it's Seapoint Farms. 
seed gotcha. point farms. It doesn't make any sense, but um, <laughs> and they are non-GMO. They're not organic, but non they're non-GMO. Um, I wouldn't recommend, you know, if you're a wasabi person, they have different flavors and stuff, but I think these are really the best and it's lightly salted. Dietitian approved and Hannah could um, second that because she's also a dietitian. <laughs> nice. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the more the merrier. <laughs> I put a question in the chat, but I didn't want to shift off this. What do you do? You think cookbooks are obsolete? Um, what was the question? Sorry, I'm just wondering if you think cookbooks are are obsolete. If you're looking at saving space and recipe planning, oh, which ones you could get rid of? Just in general, do we do we need them? I'm I have a bunch of them, but I've pared them down. I'm just wondering. <laughs> because mm. everybody has them online everybody has all their recipes true also. I would yeah I I think that's a brilliant question um and I'm sure Stacy has an answer as well I would go if if you because again with the clutter it just adds up so quickly and I think if it um I think someone said if it brings you joy keep it if it doesn't <laughs> get rid of it <laughs> yep there's um, that but if there's cool, if you, if you're like, yeah, I use this often, then keep it. But if you don't, like you said, like you could have a Google doc with the re your websites that you like to get recipes from or YouTube channels or whatever, and just stick to that. Um, uh, less is more always. And I'm working on getting rid of um, books uh, myself. And I think it's just, uh, you know, having a conversation with yourself about like your attachments and what you can let go of. Um, because, uh, we're not going to take stuff with us in the next life. Um, and we're not going to be buried in a pyramid with our stuff, <laughs> at least not this life, maybe next one. <laughs> yeah. I so, have had this conversation really recently with a client of mine who's got an entire, I would say maybe like, uh, like a six foot by two foot closet that's got probably six shelves inside. And it is floor to ceiling cookbooks. And she's like, I know that I don't need all of these cookbooks, but it's such a part of my identity. How do I let this go? And you know, she, yeah. Yeah. The identity piece, right? Yeah. So I worked with a client who was like, oh, I'm a foodie. And that's the language she uses all the time. And then like two years ago, she was like, I'm the person that does all the cookbook things. She has all the tartine books. She has all the fit, the new upcoming, whatever. And Tartine is a bakery locally, um, for those who don't know. But um, um, so over the years, in order, so we are, we have these like experiences from the past, right? And this is the habits and routines and stuff we have that helped us be who we are up to now. And then to be and get to where we want to be, we need to change certain things to get there. And so it's like the mindset of, this experience um and literally like what you keep what you consume like media wise or entertainment or literally food consumption and so I think it's helpful like now when she talks she just cooks simple meals and her family she thought like her family had expectations of like they wanted this on the holidays or whatever but her family doesn't care like whatever <laughs> happens on the holiday and the holiday meal, whatever, or the birthday meals, like it's cool. It's all good. And the goal is to have a good time together. Um, that meaningful connection, not necessarily about like the history of the family recipes or whatever, but the family recipes are important, but you know, not, a, not the biggest thing in the world. Yeah. And I, there's a couple of, a couple of things that could maybe help folks with extensive collections, if you would like to whittle it down. So two things, and, and some of these are kind of like, duh, but I'll mention anyway, if you, I had a lot of cookbooks, I pared down about five or six years ago there. I realized there were like probably at least a half a dozen cookbooks where I just, I kept the book for one recipe or two recipes, a whole book for two recipes. And I was like, okay, that's probably unnecessary. So I just took pictures of the recipes that I made all the time. And I created a separate folder 
in iPhoto for recipes. And I just started dropping the recipes into that folder. And then at some point after I kind of, I, I did that with all the cookbooks I was getting rid of. I also have a three ring binder with a bunch of recipes that I have been saving my whole entire life. And I digitized all of that. So now I have like the photos I took of the recipe pages, um, the cookbook pages and the stuff that I maybe, I don't know, friends or family had given me over the years. That's all digitized in a PDF file that's actually text searchable. So I can find what I'm looking for. Again, when I'm on, I could be at the grocery store and wondering what's in a certain recipe and I can pull it up on my phone. Yay. Um, so that, and then also uh, regarding identity and cookbooks, I think I want to encourage people to think about seasons of their lives. I think we have all had periods of time throughout our lives where we've been a particular kind of person, a person who's a runner or a person who is an artist or a person who roller skates or who got really into pastry making. And like, those are things like you can, you can go all in on a hobby for a period of time. And then maybe it just doesn't blow your skirt up anymore. 10 years down the road. That's okay. Because other things do blow your skirt up now. And it's okay to lean into those things and let the other stuff go. It doesn't mean it's gone forever or that it's irretrievable. Usually it's a cookbook. You can probably still find that recipe if you let it go by accident or, you know, want to look for it later. But those are, it is, it is hard to get rid of anything that's really tied to our identity. But if you just sort of think of the arc of your life as, you know, you'll always be an artist, you'll always be a baker, but maybe that's just not the focus of your life right now because you've moved on to other things because you're growing always into new and different things. So it's okay to let those things go. Beautiful. Did Can that I answer I... your question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> 10 minute answer yes. to your question. Yes, it did. And thank you for that. <laughs> it's it's more I feel like we have things and there are fun recipes that we still make and some of them we probably have memorized and just wondering sometimes we go through these spurts where we get rid of everything and then we, you know, is it I don't know. And I, it's not an identity thing, but it is a is it no longer practical and, and serve us? And, and Stacy's familiar with my kitchen. I probably have 10 cookbooks and need two of them, but I still hold on to that cupcake book <laughs> because it's <laughs> fun and it's cute. And my daughter likes to look at yeah. it. I don't know. Someday I'll, I'll part with it. I just, just wondering if people use them anymore and if we really should not be buying them. And I'm so glad Emily asked the question because we have a whole bookshelf of them. And I can assure you that most of them, like 99% of them, we never look at ever, ever. Yeah, my husband's staring at me right now, giving me an evil eye, but I'm telling you, we never look at <laughs> hey, so there are a handful that we, that we do. And if you go to open it, like it'll automatically open to a particular recipe because you use it a lot. Yeah. So yeah, we probably could pare it down to, I will even just say a dozen. He's like, nope, nope, you can't do that. I have one cookbook that I use so often that the pages started to fall out and I actually had to buy a second copy. That one I will keep forever. Mm -hmm. And I also bought a digital version of it because again, I like to be able to see my stuff when I'm walking around. I don't want to have to be home to see what I need. So <laughs> that's a, that's one, like if that's your cookbook, man, keep that sucker. Like it's doing something for you. But the ones that you never look at, let somebody else love them. So now that we, you, our interest has been peaked, you must disclose what this cookbook is. <laughs> oh, this is a compilation cookbook that Bon Appetit magazine put out and it's called the Food Lovers Cleanse. I've, I bought, Vicki, did I get you guys a copy of that one? You probably did. I probably did. I feel like I've, I probably bought a dozen copies of this cookbook and gifted it to people over the years because that is how impactful it has been. It's one of, and Alicia, you would absolutely love it. Um, it's called the food lovers cleanse because they published it in January as the antidote to the holiday season. And they're just like 365 days of recipes. And it's really clever the way that it's designed in that it's seasonal. So if you're in winter, you can go to the winter section and they'll have breakfast, lunches, and dinners and all of the recipes sort of tie in. So if you have leftovers from lunch, you can apply that to your dinner and lots of, um, 
really hearty oatmeal kind of big batch stuff that you can do for breakfast. There's this really lovely uh, spiced nut mix that I make that's really like you can eat it by itself or you can sprinkle it on other stuff. I use that thing all the time. And it's nice. some, like not very many ingredients per recipe. So it's like you might have to make a sauce or something, but you can have it in the freezer just ready to go. Other than that, we're talking like three to five ingredients max for most of their recipes. So it's really simple. I will um, drop that link in the chat as well. That's awesome. So the, um, I think recipes are helpful, but um, that book sounds like it's, it's more helpful in helping with creating the system. And that's what my Quick and Delish Life program is about, is creating a system of meal planning to keep this going. Um, and recipes are cool because they're an idea, but a lot of times we want to modify it to meet our taste preferences or cultural preferences, et cetera. Um, and I think in my experience, a lot of people don't realize that they could modify a recipe and like not knowing like what ingredients are essential versus non-essential. And once we see the list of 10 or more ingredients and, uh, it's just too hard. Um, and like first, like, um, just thinking about like what you do now and how you can add to that in a sustainable way to make sure you're, you know, prioritizing variety. Um, that's one of the pillars of my program is start from what you know and build on that. Because a lot of times some people are like, oh, I'm going to do some meal planning. I'm going to go online and find a bunch of recipes. Um, yeah. But that's effort put in a new direction versus uh, sustaining and creating the foundation of what already exists. That's yeah, that's a good point. That's why I think a lot of people are really intimidated when they think about engaging with the nutritionist because they think it's going to be, oh, I'm not allowed to eat anything ever again. And it's going to be really, really hard, <laughs> which is not not your model. <laughs> it's more. <laughs> what do you currently enjoy? Like, I think you can always just like with organizing, I don't expect anything that perfection is a silly goal. It doesn't exist better. Better is the goal. Like just making small tweaks to your, your nutrition can make a huge impact on your life in the same way that making small tweaks to your physical space can give you a huge mood boost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Better is always, um, the way and the journey continues. <laughs> until the end <laughs> so do you have any um if we if we eat with our eyes first do you have any tricks to help a 10 year old who's picky with sensory issues eat more food oh, man, that great isn't question. Just plain pasta and <laughs> sweets i mean sometimes some days one thing will work some days it won't it's it's tough it's tough to find nutrition for a child that's picky I mean, I was, I was super picky, maybe not as much with a lot of sensory, um, preferences, but, um, I think I had some t texture taste stuff, but, um, you know, I think it's going with like the texture that, you know, already works and then it's going to be hit or miss. So you're always going to have to be flexible. Um, and so I think just knowing that you're going to do the best and your child is going to do their best. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, there could be like simple swap outs that might not be identified or they may, might be identified depending on, you know, um, the sen the sense the, the sensitivity. Um, and so, um, like say for pasta, you could try, and I'm not going to say it's going to work, but you could try like bonza pasta, which has more protein in it. Um, and um, so some swap outs for like this ingredient instead of that ingredient that has more nutrition. So literally like per bite. And I know we're, you know, we were talking about colors or you said eating with their eyes. So that doesn't necessarily answer that part of the question, but I was going for nutrition first. Um, and like if, uh, like I have an enchilada sauce that's made primarily with carrots. So it's like onions and garlic and carrots with like the spices. And this sounds maybe a little bit more adult, but it's just like an idea way of thinking that it's an orange sauce. And so if a puree orange thing would be accepted or a carrot red bell pepper sauce, if it's puree, then maybe it could be added as a sauce to something. And then that would be a liquid form of vegetables. 
Um, and then you could do the same thing with something green, um, make like a roasted broccoli, you know, feta cheese soup that's puree that tastes, you know, like includes the flavor profiles that are theoretically accepted. And then see where you can uh, maybe use bone broth and bone broth would add more protein than if you use like vegetable stock. And so literally going for like more nutrition per sip per bite and then see what you could do with the color situation. And it's just like, you know, the try something three times kind of deal when when that is something that could happen. And I, what I found most helpful is people, children, adults, try new things or are more open to trying new things when they feel comfortable. So that means like the environment, like the sound, like the, like literally how they feel. Mm. Like if you just got, got back from a long day of whatever, um, maybe that's not a great time if, pe you know, people are a little tired or low energy or whatever, but like comfort is really important. Like I have a client who moved like three times with her son um, over the pandemic and now has purchased a home and is settled with her son. Her son now is trying new foods and cooking. And I think there's a correlation to, I mean, this is just my observations, obviously. <laughs> I haven't like done a study or anything, but with my experience, it seems like the, there was an improvement in his comfort level. And now he's more willing to try new things um, because he was a tomato sauce and meat sauce kind of kid. And now he's trying all kinds of things and cooking. He's taking a cooking class in high school too. So that also helps. Um, but I think the comfort level and like, like in your experience from observations, like what helps your child be comfortable? And that was when to present uh, a new idea. I think that's great. Thank you, Alicia. It's, it's, it's always hit and miss, but flavors, like complex flavors, don't always work. But if you separate out a piece of chicken or salmon and then rice or a vegetable, that might work, but not, but if you it, not combined, yeah. If you were to do enchiladas with the sauce or a pasta oh. with the sauce, she won't do the sauce, but oh, she okay. put everything in the sauce. It's just interesting. Yeah, yeah. That sounds um that makes sense. Yeah, I mean separate is okay. It's okay. I mean, it's, it's just the way for now. Yeah. And maybe um, it'll be the Have you made the, the lentil way. wraps yet? I have not because they stick to the pan. <sighs> yeah, I've got, destroyed yeah. lentil wraps. Darn it. Yeah. You, the, so, um, the, I just, during the pandemic, I discovered this <laughs> the stupid easiest thing in the whole wide world. You just, um, soak I think it's one cup of lentils, red two lentils. cups of water. Yeah, red lentils. You just soak it overnight and then um, you drain it. And then you, I don't know, you could probably just use the water that they're soaked in, whatever, but you puree it in a Vitamix or whatever blender you have, turn it into this batter. Um, I, I will normally do like a half a teaspoon each of salt, onion powder and garlic powder, but you can put anything you want in there to give it some flavor. And that's it. It's lentils and water and whatever spices you want. And it makes this beautiful batter, but you have to use a nonstick skillet. That's in pretty good condition because it will stick like dag nasty to any other surface. But if you have a nice nonstick skillet, it like cooks beautifully in about three minutes. And it just makes this, um, a wrap that you can, you can, it's a little delicate. So I don't like to use it for burritos because it's not going to hold up if you're trying to handle it, but I'll use it almost like flatbread and put anything on top of that. Um, I'll even do like a, turn it into an appetizer and make a, something that you would normally make with cream cheese, but I make with non-fat yogurt or even just low fat plain yogurt. You can spice that however you want, put some chives, put some onions, whatever in there, and then cut up some vegetables, put that on top. It's like just it's a really lovely texture that offsets whatever crunchy stuff you put on top. And that, I was just thinking about that, that you could easily sneak other vegetables into that batter. Like you could do bell pepper or carrots or something like that, just a little bit if they're soft enough and they, you could puree it into that batter. Sneaky, sneaky. Yeah. I've made, um, 
like street tortilla uh, size uh, lentil tortillas and those are pretty good and they're not like super like I mean corn tortillas aren't really that strong yeah um but similar um um uh uh integrity I guess I don't know Awesome. Got a question from Chris before she left. Um, she's asking about culling your spice collection. So I'm Alicia, if you don't mind, I'm going to start from the organizer's perspective, and then I would love to get your opinion on this. So I will often advise people, there's certain spices you just should never buy at Costco. Like don't, don't bother buying in bulk because they degrade. The quality degrades so quickly. Mostly we're talking green herbs like basil, parsley, cilantro. I, I would only buy the smallest container of that because within three to four months, the nutritional value is shot and the flavor profile is tanked. So it's not going to hurt you, but it's not going to flavor your food very well either. So, um, so there's a lot of spices that I, I think you're not saving yourself any money if you buy certain things bulk in big quantity and think you're just going to refill from that same container. Cause if it's like three years old, it's not doing you much. I agree. Uh, I, and yeah, like Trader Joe's has a good, um, selection of like basic, um, spices that aren't too expensive. Um, and there's, um, uh, certain places have, I mean, Trader Joe's I think has the best prices for, you know, the smaller bottles of spices and herbs. Um, but yeah, I think going for, um, the basics they use often, like I'll buy like one of the time I like buying cinnamon from Trader Joe's and oregano. Um, and the last time I, I got cinnamon, I got four of the jars because I, I use cinnamon. I'll like when I have cinnamon, I'm probably having like a teaspoon each time Your cinnamon to the one user. serving, <laughs> <laughs> um, at least if not more. And like, sometimes I'll, like I always, I'm the person that takes off the shaker part. Cause I'm like, yeah. that's a barrier to deliciousness. Oh, I completely agree with you. I threw one out <laughs> yesterday and Jesse was like, do you want this? And I was like, no, it's in my way. <laughs> I'd rather, I like to pour things in my hand and then just pinch and sprinkle because I feel like I have way more control over how much gets into the food. That damn shaker either the spice inside got too much moisture and it's all stuck together or it's so loose that it comes out fast and furious and you're just like well there goes my meal exactly so many nuances to make this stuff happen um but I mean I don't have a huge list of herbs and spices that I use uh it's usually like oregano cumin um garam masala curry powder dried thyme um uh, let's see some ancho. Um, uh, I'm not, he, I don't use the powdered garlic and onion as much, but I like the idea. It's just not quite in my flow. Yeah. Um, cause I didn't grow up having garlic and onion powder. So it just didn't kind of like pick up and in like restaurants, the restaurants that I worked in didn't use that. And I know some do, um, you know, so like what's funny barbecue about that place is where we grew up, where Emily and I grew up. They never, we never saw fresh garlic ever you couldn't get it for most of the year because we grew up in the northern upper peninsula of Michigan and it's isolated so some of those ingredients were very difficult to ship there I'm sure I, I think it's a little bit different now I find things more easily now but when we were kids in the winter time you're not getting onions and garlic you're everything's coming out of a shaker <laughs> yeah it totally or makes it sense why ranch dressing has become so popular because it was um, a vessel, the, the buttermilk liquid for the vessel of the garlic and the onion powder. Yep. Any other questions or comments, statements? This is a little off topic out of the kitchen, but how do you keep up with clutter? I feel like I can get organized. I have the tools in place. But then it it goes sideways when the mail comes in or the stuff comes in, the backpacks, the shoes, and I don't know how, how do you how do y'all keep up with that? Well, I think when you have little ones and their ability to comply with whatever the 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 decluttering rules are, it's always going to be a little bit of a challenge. But 
probably the easiest thing or the the best way to set yourself up for success, which you've probably already done, is create drop zones for specific items. So drop zone for the backpack and the jackets and the shoes when they first get home goes here. And even if that pile gets a little unwieldy, at least they're like in the right region of the house. And so if you do a little five minute pickup before bedtime or something, for example, you're just kind of tidying up those zones instead of having to move specific items from one end of the house to the other. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you could try having the kids involved in like five minute, five minute tidy up or something once a day. It's like, okay, I get a timer that actually makes a big ding and say, I'm setting the timer. You have five minutes and, and maybe like the first week or so have them before you start the timer, have them walk around the house and say, can you identify where, like, where, what do you think the, the spots are that need help here? What do you see that's out of place? And kind of get them in the habit of actually looking for those things. Because that's helpful for their future self. Definitely. So it's training and it makes it so that it's built in versus like, oh, they have to figure out how to be an organized person, which is uh, often normal. Yeah. I, I think building like the system, like, like the, like, cause things let are let go. Right. I'm speaking from experience. Um, <laughs> um, and it, it's like, if you're like Tuesday, whatever day is like the day that's like, okay, this life happened for a couple of num like a number of days can you have like a day on your calendar that's like the grounding? Okay, like let's like clear and have the five minute thing and, you know, like the mail and uh, I mean, maybe not all the things all in one day, but like you could be like, where are we? Like just to check in with self. Um, where are we? How are things going? And um, what needs attention? So then it's a generic response versus like specific to the mail or specific to the zone the drop zone or whatever it's just like where are we now and like what do I need to put some attention to and that's uh, I like thinking about things in a ge general way because then we can apply that to anything like meal planning or health mm -hmm. or exercise because things will let go and like the goal is to like hold on to what's important but not so tightly that makes it really overwhelming um, another tool that I came across recently that I meant to share with you before now, but it, it is flowcharts. It's it sounds it sounds like so simple, but even like a three step flowchart, like a a graphic, and this is one of the things that I like. I what got me started practicing in Canva is trying to come up with these cute little tools that the like, kids could actually use to help, like with morning routines. So a flowchart in the bathroom could be um three three steps it could be like first we make our bed then we maybe four steps make our bed eat breakfast brush teeth get packed for school just so like they have that a visual representation of the steps that they are responsible for every morning I know like they kind of know what their routine is but I feel like their their little minds are just um being pulled in so many directions it's hard for them to stay on task and that visual infographic can kind of pull them back to where they need to be that came up in, um, I'm, I'm working through a certification in brain-based behaviors, like people, folks that either have ADHD or somewhere on the autistic spectrum. So there's all kinds of little things that you can implement with folks whose attentions are even harder to wrangle than neurotypical people. Which is already hard. Yes, exactly. I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopolize. I. Um, I had a question on food prepping because every Saturday or Sunday morning, depending on when I have time, I do all my meal planning for the week, but I don't necessarily food prep. But if I decide I'm, I want to use kale for a certain recipe, but it comes in big bunches, then I want to be able to use it at least twice. But I don't, I don't, I put it on the board. It's visual. So the kids can see every day what we're going to have. Um, if their friends come over, they can see what meal they're going to have, if they want to come back for dinner, things like that. But I don't prep. I see some the crazy preppers out there where they have stacks of containers in their fridge with the whole week done. And does that really work? I, I, I can't imagine that would 
work for me. I don't know. It does work for kale for two reasons, because kale for me is a pain in the butt to chop. So if you have like, if you get two bunches of kale, um, it takes up a lot of space in the fridge too, when it's in its full leaf form, because it just is like awkward and it doesn't really fit anywhere. So if I just take the stems out and the stems, I'll even, again, Emily, you're going to have an issue with this. I, I'm, I'm always telling Emily to put stuff in her freezer and she's like, my freezer's this big. It's not going to work, but I'll take the stems, cut those up and put those in a bag. Anytime I have vegetable matter that I would normally put in the compost, I started putting in a gallon Ziploc bag and that's soup stock. So I'm not really wasting any kale, but I take the, the ribs out and just chop the leaves into whatever form factor I think I'm going to need for the recipe. I can even do two different chops depending on what the recipes are, but then you can kind of really compress it into like a small bag or a small container because you kind of take the air out and it, it takes up this much space in the fridge instead of this. Mm -hmm. And it's less irritating because when you're trying to cook, you just grab a handful and plop and you're done. And you can, uh, yeah, I, I second the notion about the kale situation. You can, depending on the space of your refrigerator, um, Stacy's refrigerator happens to be very small. Um, <laughs> Big freezer, tiny fridge. I have the opposite problem with most people. Yeah. Um, but um, so I, you, like if, if you're doing one thing, like you have kale and you're going to use it, cut up all the kale you have, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm not saying, uh, I don't do that all the time, but sometimes that makes sense. So I have two bunches of kale. I cut it all up. I put it in a lettuce spinner. I clean it. And then sometimes I store it in the lettuce spinner. That might be too much space for some people. And I might put it in a container or a Ziploc bag, depending on the space in my refrigerator. Um, but that's kind of cool. Cause then you just have this lettuce spinner with kale in it and you could just like, whatever, add it to anything um, or add it to the two diff different recipes that you mentioned. But then it's not like you don't have to put it in another container to then have to wash both the lettuce spinner and the whatever. Um, and then um, sometimes it might be helpful. Um, I'm just adding more ideas, but instead of like having a cutting board and a knife to cut the kale. So I cut the Scissors. kale and then, yes. See, there's a little, there's a little mind reading going on. So uh, use kitchen scissors. So I cut the kale before washing it and then deal with washing it afterwards because it's going to actually get washed more thoroughly that way. Not that I'm like, you know, like a clean freak, but um, uh, it's just helpful to do some steps in certain ways. You can wash the kale first and cut it, whatever floats your boat. Um, um, and then... So in terms of all the containers and doing all the work in advance, like everybody has their own way that works for them. And sometimes, you know, like good on them to have everything prepped um, in single containers or whatever works for them for the future. But I'm a person, I'm, I do a couple different strategies depending on what's going on. And one of them is I cook a lot and I freeze in single servings in, and, and, and then I'm good to go and I can heat up from the freezer. And then at the end of the month, I like restock the freezer so that I always have go-to things for me to just eat for lunch or dinner. Um, and then I'll- That's um, another good reason to pre to do your, to prep the vegetables too, because if let's say you shop on Sunday and now it's Wednesday and you're like, oh, I was going to eat the kale and the cauliflower on Thursday, but now we're going out to eat and we're whatever. If- if it's already prepped, you can just put that in the freezer and then dig it out later when you need it and it doesn't go to waste. But I find if you leave things whole, they'll just sit in the back of the fridge until they're no good. Totally. And you're like, oh, sad kale. But if you have sad kale or broccoli or vegetable that's like that and it's soft and you're like sad, but you could actually bring it back to life if you put it, you cut the cut face yeah. and you put it in cold water. And then it'll absorb the water and come back. So you don't have to compost it in, until you try that method. And then if it yeah. doesn't work, because it's every so five sad. celery a couple of times, like sometimes it's beyond and you can't recover it. But every once in a while, if it's just like a little soft and you put it in water, it bounces back. Exactly. There's, yeah, there's dead and then there's just a little sad. And that's what you put in your stock too. Exactly. And you can put it in yep. the freezer. Yeah, that's the stuff. Once the stuff gets like, it's not really appetizing, like nobody, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the other F word, flaccid celery. You know, once it gets to a certain point, you're not 
it's not crunchy or delicious and you're not going to eat it, but it's still, it's still got nutritional value. So that's a really good, a good thing to put in the old stock bag in the freezer. You can make soup out of it, not completely waste it. Good Vicky point. and Dave are the soup masters. You guys are always making stock of some sort. Oh, well, you're the, you're the Vicky and Dave? Them. Vicky? Yes, Vicky. Yeah. <laughs> so those are all Dave's cookbooks. I'm just blaming it on him. <laughs> Hannah, but did you have any? I'm happy we're not getting rid of them. <laughs> and I'm right surprised now he still lets me come them. over to your house. He's probably like, Stacy's going to tell me to get rid of everything. Oh no, you haven't been in his office. You have no idea. <laughs> we well, even I'm... tell the cleaning lady, don't go in there. Just don't, you'll like you'll you'll get lost. You won't be able I've to. I've seen his SIGGRAPH coffee mug collection, so I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a helpful thought to have, should I get rid of it in the head periodically? Because uh we it might be an opportunity to letting go. I think I can be sneaky and I think I could find a few that I know we've never used <laughs> and I'll go put them in a closet or somewhere, right? I'm not going to throw them away or, or donate them because then if he really does realize they're gone, but I think I could probably sneak a few out and he wouldn't know. Hide them long enough that if like a year goes by and he hasn't looked for them in that amount of time, it's probably safe to actually let them leave the house. That's my, that's my, um, I, I don't normally advocate for spouses exercising Sneakiness. trickery on each other but but sometimes you know that that's a helpful tip well what I do with that is because I swear there were some boxes that were not open for two years and moved from one house to another yeah that happens just like, a lot hey you know what I don't really think you need what's ever in there and if you're not ready to go through them then they have to go in your office because then I don't have to see them and if you have so many boxes in there that you can't move around well that's not my problem <laughs> right <laughs> That's why he has the bigger office. Anyways, this has been great. Thank you guys. Well, we are up to the three o'clock hour just about. So um, if, if you have any questions that have not been answered, please feel free to shout out. Um, and actually what I'm going to do right now is just drop our contact information. Um, you, I'm sure you all know how to use Zoom by now, but if you want to save the Zoom chat, you can just click on the three little dots at the bottom of the Zoom chat and say save chat and you'll get a transcript. Oh, this says my message is too long. So I was going to put our, our contact information in there, but let's see. Um, I think everybody has mine except for Hana. So I'm just going to put that there. And then I've got Alicia's handy. Let's see if this is too long. Thank you. There we go. Just copy to your, your email signature. <clears throat> so does anybody so, have any feedback or, um, you know, would this be helpful for anybody else that you know? I think so. I really, I really, sorry, can I, I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Um, I, I like having two people together moder moderating monitoring um it's really interesting thoughts and strategies um there's always something to learn and interesting conversation on the cookbooks because i think what cookbooks and really it just comes down to like inspiration yeah and so hearing other people's ideas i'm like oh yeah because it's impossible no matter how skilled you are to have every idea all of the time in your head and so sometimes you just need to be you know shown a the spark a spark. So thank you for the spark. I could always use more. <laughs> awesome. And for me, the idea of digitizing those recipes that are in the three ring binder, I have several of those and I have not digitized them. So thank you for that suggestion because sort of our favorite recipes, I do have them in drop in a shared Dropbox. Yeah. So easy access, but you know, I spend time sometimes going through these books, flipping through going, where's that recipe that I yeah. want to go? Where's your mother's pumpkin pie recipe? I don't know. I mean, and then that that is wasted time. I mean, and well, Vicky, I have a high speed scanner at my house, so if next time we get together, I can I can either bring it to yours or you guys can come here and we can like we can get all of your stuff digitized in like a half an hour. Get her done. Yep. Well, it sounds really good. Thanks a lot. That won't be an option for everyone, but <laughs> for anybody who comes to my house once in a while. You can always but you can do it um, online in a virtual session, certainly. Yeah. 
Well, we'll make sure that you guys get the link to the recording just in case you want to reference any part of the conversation. Um, and yeah, a lot, uh, if, if and you, you can pass on the goodness to anybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, cheers to a fabulous February. We really appreciate your time and oh, your questions cool. and comments and um, cheers to the next version of everybody here. Thank you guys for showing up today. We really appreciate it. Thank you both. You're welcome. Bye, a pleasure. Bye.